94th Infantry Division disbanded. December 8th 31, 1942. Desi Dana 8. The situation required that our CP be moved away from a small oak grove. On the night of December 8th 9, it was moved back to the height of 108.8. I don't know which headquarters was located here a few weeks ago. Or maybe it was just a communications position, or an artillery unit standing here. Dekaji 9 On December 9th, a new commander was sent to us. I never understood why Oberst Steffler, as he introduced himself to us, should be here. In addition, it was unclear to me what functions the regimental headquarters was performing. The few remaining units were part of the Rhenish group. At that time, we were only performing administrative duties, which included providing food and ammunition, as well as searching for winter uniforms. I was glad when I learned that our comrades from the 16th Panzer Division helped our soldiers at the front with winter clothing. By jointly bearing the brunt of the defensive fighting at height 147.6, Krauss's battle group established good relations with comrades from the 79th Motorized Regiment, and instead of feeling like a mere appendage, as had been the case in recent weeks with the other units to which they had been attached, our soldiers were now part of the same family. The fierce fighting in the defence, which broke out here and there on December 11th, contributed especially to this. When the Russians succeeded in gaining an invective in a separate area, they were quickly knocked back by a counter-attack. We all realised that if the enemy passed through us, he would roll from the north in an avalanche and pass the whole city. I accompanied our new commander, Colonel Steffler, as he visited the headquarters of his subordinate units to help him better assess the situation. We learned that ten division headquarters officers, headed by General Pfeiffer, were to flee out of the encirclement to receive new assignments outside the cauldron, I realist that our division should transfer the remnants of its regiments and reinforcement units to other divisions and that these officers would be able to do more for us, those remaining in the cauldron, while outside the cauldron. Dekenum 12 On December 12th and 13 we fought hard on the defensive. The rations were becoming more and more scarce. Our good fortune was that as members of the hot truppen we had horses, which were shared among all divisions. Horses became the main food for our soldiers. If we took prisoners, the soldiers first of all checked if the enemy had anything left to eat. At Autositan 14, Colonel Steffler disappeared from our headquarters as quickly as he appeared in it. He visited us for exactly five days. In his place remained the former commander of the 194th Anti-Tank Battalion, Major von Nordheim. He was given the task of liquidating the still existing 276th Grenadier Infantry Regiment and disbanding the regimental headquarters. Major von Nordheim was a conscripted from the reserves a sociable man of about 50 years of age. Before being conscripted, he had been the director of the man factory in Nuremberg. Nordheim was an avid hunter and tried to pass the long evening hours by talking about his hunting adventures, which gave us a chance to forget for a while the desperate situation in which we found ourselves. Dekshiwa 16. On December 16th, the air temperature again crossed the zero degrees Celsius mark. However, in the evening of December 17th, Brutal frosts and hurricane icy winds came again. We already knew that the headquarters had to be disbanded by December 31st, 1942. Major von Nordheim offered me a choice between the 24th and 16th Panzer Divisions. Without thinking long, I asked to go to the 16th Tank Division. There I could meet my old friends, the last remaining soldiers of my 7th Company. My request was granted and I was issued the appropriate documents. Our staff tailor made me a hat and a pair of mittens out of a piece of sheepskin. Now at least my head and hands were warm. December 16th and 17 were again difficult days, both for the entire 79th Motorized Regiment and for the remnants of my company and my battalion. The enemy again, supported by artillery and tanks, tried to break through our defences. 
but the Russian attack was repulsed with heavy losses. It was incredible how my comrades on the front line managed to hold on. The icy wind was hammering bits of ice through every gap in their uniforms. It was coming from the east at great speed, sweeping everything in its path across the steppe, which was bare at this time of year. We all tried to protect ourselves from it somehow. Even a wall made of snow protected us from the wind. No one left their shelters unless absolutely necessary. But if it was necessary, everyone tried to move twice as fast in order to get to the next spot that would give some protection from the weather. We were all happy when the wind died down after four days. On December 23rd, it snowed with no end in sight. Deck to 24. The supply by our Luftwaffe was not established as reliably as we had hoped and as we had been promised. Our food was constantly scarce, and our ammunition was getting scarcer and scarcer. We had to conserve these precious things as never before. I felt extremely fortunate that we still had horses. We were dividing them up fairly so that everyone would get something. Our supply chief tried to get extra food for Christmas Eve. Our comrades at the front on that day received a whole loaf of bread instead of the usual 200 grams. Additional portions of sausage were made from horse meat. There was also some red wine, but it was not enough for everyone. So in the field kitchens they prepared something like punch so that everyone could have a portion of it. But more important than all this, each soldier was given ten cigarettes. At night we could hear the roar of the engines of our airplanes. The Russians, when they learned that our planes were dropping containers of food and ammunition at night, lit beacons just as our soldiers do. As a result, many such containers fell near the Ivan's positions or on no man's land. Each time it became a heavy loss for us. At 8pm, in accordance with Major von Nordheim's orders, the remnants of the regimental headquarters assembled in the largest room of the bunker. The Christmas tree was replaced by a pine branch. Where did they get it from? The soldiers' hoarse throats were singing the words of a song. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. Many of them suddenly had a lump in their throats. Major von Nordheim then addressed us. He emphasised the seriousness of our situation, the fact that all of us here in the East, far from home and from our relatives, are fighting for our people. He ended his speech with the words, And last but not least, we must continue to do our duty as soldiers because we owe it to our fallen comrades. This speech was followed by the song O du Frohlich. Then ten comrades sang the song Standing Soldier on the Volga from Tsarevich. And at the end of the evening we sang the song O Tannenbaum. Then we all went to our hiding places. I could see from the faces of my comrades that their thoughts, like mine, were of home. Never in former years had we had to celebrate Christmas in such depressing surroundings. I was writing a letter to my dear little wife, and in doing so I tried to conceal my gloomy feelings, my uncertainty about what awaited us. They all have enough to worry about at home. Should I make it worse, even though I am living through the blackest of dark times? On all German radio programmes, Christmas greetings could be relayed home from all fronts. One could hear the voices of comrades from northern Norway, Africa, and from here, from the cauldron of Stalingrad. The Reich Minister of Propaganda, Dr Goebbels, on behalf of the homeland, made an address to the soldiers fighting at the front. For us, coming from Central Europe, all these distances on the map seemed enormous and what difficulties with logistics we had to overcome here in Russia. We heard from one and another that tank formations of von Manstein's army group, Army Group Don, were on their way here to unblock the cauldron from the southwest. This news gave us new strength, although we ourselves knew how difficult it would be to push forward after these heavy snowfalls. Still, we were confident that our command would not leave us in distress. On December 24th, it snowed so much all day that it was hard to see what was going on ten metres away from you. Where does this disgusting substance come from? Thank God everything remained quiet in our section. It seems that the enemy is also having a hard time in this weather. December 25th We were wrong about the Ivans. At exactly a five or on December 25th, 
we were awakened by the loud sounds of battle. The thunder of cannon shots, the howling of Stalin's organs, the explosions of howitzer shells, as it seemed to me, quite near. On the left flank of the combat group, Rheinisch. Now it was possible to hear and the rumble of tank gun shots. In our headquarters immediately announced the alarm. Major von Nordheim called the Rhenish group, from where he was informed that the Russians were attacking the left flank of the 16th Panzer Division, with tanks and large masses of infantry. The main target was the height 139.7. Fighting was breaking out even behind the left flank of the sector of Rhenish's group. The sounds of battle continued to reach us all day long. Would our soldiers withstand this assault? We all hoped so, even though we realised how difficult the task was. With each passing hour, the snow drifts were getting higher, and it was becoming more and more difficult to move about on the ground. In such cases, it is almost impossible to walk. One can only run. In the evening, we learned that despite heavy losses, the enemy had captured the height of 139.7. Our losses were also very high. December 26th, at about 03. In the early morning of December 26th, as dawn was slowly rising, the sounds of another battle were again heard from the north. On inquiry to the headquarters of Rheinisch's group, we were told that our counter-attack on the height of 139.7 had been repulsed by Russian fire from the shelters. Another Russian attack did not follow. However, our comrades were ordered to entrench and build shelters, all this at night, in the frozen ground under artillery and mortar fire, and, most importantly, they had to be ready at any moment to rush to repel an enemy attack. Decante 27. On the evening of December 27th, my Futtermeister Gregoletz showed up unexpectedly. He was worried about our remaining horses, which were sheltered somewhere in town. Gregoletz looked very depressed. He reported, There's only a handful of horse feed left. In any case, the weakest animals have already been slaughtered. Most of the remaining ones will be slaughtered as well. When you manage to get something that can be used as horse fodder, the strongest of them are given this fodder to keep them alive as long as possible. Herr Oberleutnant, so far I have been able to keep your mumpets alive. But now, no matter how hard I try, I can't do it. I understood my old forager, this farmer from Upper Silesia, very well. For many years he had looked after the company horses. He had managed to ensure their survival during the very harsh winter of 1941-42. And here he stood, helpless, unable to save his trusting four-legged friends. Lacking the necessary forage, he became as powerless as any of us. We looked at each other with heavy eyes and I said to him, Then you need to slaughter my mum pizza too. We shook hands firmly and said goodbye and Gregoletz went outside. I prayed to myself for mumpets. I could not hold back the dark thoughts that had taken hold of me. My riding horse mumpets would remain in my memory as stubborn, full of life and a source of anxiety. He was a knave in the horse tribe. Dekashtra 28 Unless something unforeseen happens, I will be back in my company in three days. It is now called First Company. 79th Motorised Regiment, and is under the 16th Panzer Division, but it is still the same soldiers from my former 2nd Battalion, 276th Grenadier Infantry Regiment. Only a Hauptfeld Feeble from the former 1st Company of the 79th Motorised Regiment with a transport has been added to us. He is in charge of supplying the soldiers. Major von Nordheim suggested that we spend the rest of the year together with him, as our 276th Grenadier Regiment would cease to exist on January 1st, 1943. Our headquarters will be divided, officers and soldiers will be scattered among the headquarters and departments of the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions. Through a messenger, I received a message from Gregolitz that my riding horse had fallen the same night it was decided to be slaughtered. I did not know whether it was a lie to save me, for Gregolitz knew how attached I was to my mumpits. December 31st. On December 31st, the last day of this significant year for us, it stopped snowing altogether. 
the regimental kitchen cook somehow managed to get some horse meat in excess of the norm, and the regimental treasurer managed to get some alcohol. So with tea and a shot of alcohol at midnight, we entered the new year. We were Major von Nordheim, Oberleutnant Kelz, Oberzalmeister Knopp, Lieutenant Hoffmann, Oberleutnant Furch, and myself, the youngest of those gathered. We were all full of anxiety, but nevertheless felt calm and faithful. In a few hours we were to part from each other, as each of us had a new assignment. No one knew when we would have to see each other again, or if we would have to see each other at all. Late in the evening we came together for a frank conversation. Before I went back to my company, I gave my report to Major von Nordheim and bade farewell to the few remaining comrades from headquarters, who were also in readiness to go, according to assignments, to other units. My winter outfit was not suitable for the front line. I had no winter shoes, only my usual bone bowls or army boots, summer breeches and an ordinary tunic, and under that, a shirt, pants and pullover, a pair of woolen socks, an ordinary warm overcoat, a sheepskin cap and mittens made of the same. In my camping bag I had shaving and washing supplies, and that was all I had at my disposal, remains of the 276th Grenadier, Infantry Regiment, now part of the 1st Battalion, 79th Panzergrenadier Motorized Regiment, January 1, 17, 1943. Jan. 1. As I wadded through the snowdrifts, I was tearied and sweety. I almost didn't feel cold, probably because it was not very cold, and there was no wind at all. If the temperature drops below 20 degrees Celsius, you can hardly tell whether it is 20 degrees or 40 degrees. All you can say is that you are bloody cold. My destination was the CP of the Kraus Combat Group, which was to be located somewhere in the lowlands near Olovka, south of height 147.6. All remaining units of the former 276th Grenadier Infantry Regiment were placed under the command of Hauptmann Krauser. Our commander was Oberst Rheinisch of the 79th Motorized Regiment. When I reached the lowland at Orlovka, I had to ask several more times how to find Hauptmann Krauser. In that lowland, which had been forming and growing deeper for thousands of years, and from which several side branches led off, shelters like swallows' nests were clustered side by side on its slopes. Depending on the location of the slope, the shelters were sometimes higher and sometimes lower down the slope. Some were set up right along the path, while others had to be reached by climbing steps. I had to be careful as I walked along the slippery path. The many feet that had traversed it over the days had made its surface as smooth as glass. Hauptmann Krauser was already aware of my arrival. He and Lieutenant Gerlach greeted me with serious faces, but very warmly. Kraus and I had known each other well since our first meeting after the Polish campaign, when we had both been assigned from the 21st to the 94th Infantry Division at Königsbruck near Dresden. There, on the range, the new unit was then in the process of forming. Well, here you are at last. How are you, Mr. Hull? It's all right, Herr Hauptmann, as far as circumstances go. I wish they were doing better. Well, we've had it no better here. Constant casualties, very poor rations, not enough ammunition. We have to economise. And then there's the damn cold. That makes me uneasy too, Herr Hauptmann. Look at my uniform. This outfit will make me a very attractive target for the enemy on the front lines. You're right about that. Fortunately, we still have some winter clothing left, which was given to us from the 16th Panzer Division. Herr Gerlach, please see to it that Herr Hall gets what he needs. Let's look at the situation on the map. We are on the right flank of the 79th Motorized Regiment. On our left is the old 1st Battalion of this regiment under the command of Major Voth, to which we now belong. However, according to the order, we are now considered a combat group, and until specifically ordered, we report directly to the regimental command. This means that our soldiers will stay with us, as we know them better. To our right is the left flank of the 24th Panzer Division, our immediate neighbour here is the Luftwaffe Battalion of Hauptmann Mato. 
Further into the positions were our comrades from the 267th Grenadier Infantry Regiment, which had been transferred to the 24th Armoured Division. Here, too, there were no changes with the personnel. By the way, the Luftwaffe soldiers proved that you can rely on them. They actively participated in defensive battles, repelling enemy strikes for the last few days. In the evening after supper, you may go with the lieutenant and rejoin your company. Augst will familiarise you in more detail with the situation in the front line. Today, he and his men have had another difficult day. Early in the morning, the Ivans again attacked the height of 147.6, which is now constantly exposed to artillery strikes. Nevertheless, the men of Voth's battalion repulsed the attack, and we were already in the full sense of the word preparing to act in an emergency situation. I understand something happened at the front while I was on my way here. The wind carried the sounds of battle from the west, but it didn't seem to me that anything serious had happened there. You will soon realise for yourself that deep snow muffles the sounds of rips. The sound wave is also absorbed by the snow and does not make the noise we normally hear. At that time, Lieutenant Gerlach brought me some camouflage clothes and a pair of felt boots. In a few minutes, I had already pulled on my new uniform. I stuffed the free space in the boots with two pieces of shoe cloth. I had a size 39 shoe. Now I was no different from my comrades. Herr Hauptmann, before I go to my soldiers, I would like to see Hauptfeldfebel of the 1st Company of the 79th Motorised Regiment Big. I don't know him yet, but I would like to meet our new Spies, Mommy. Yeah, do me a favour. I already know him. He's a very meticulous man. I exchanged a few words with Litter Gerlach and asked him to show me where I could find my new Hauptfeldfebel. As I left the shelter, I could clearly hear the sounds of shell bursts. They were coming from the northwest direction. The room occupied by Hauptfeld Fable Bieger and his few subordinates was almost no different from any other hiding place. For the most part, they were two by three metres in size, but occasionally, albeit quite rarely, they were larger. The shelters were dug into the clay slopes of the gully. In this way, it was possible to save construction materials which was important when wood was scarce. The upper covering, which replaced the ceiling, was most often built of railroad ties. The ceiling was reinforced with earth from excavation works. The front wall was made of planks and the side and back walls were, so to speak, the natural material of the garda slope, i.e. clay soil. Along the walls were double-board bunks for sleeping and a sort of hearth. It was impossible to live here without heating the premises. And necessity, as we know, has always been the mother of invention. I greeted Bigay and introduced myself as the new company commander. Being only 169 centimetres tall, I looked dwarfed by my spisse, who was a full head taller than me. When he answered my questions, I knew from his accent that I was dealing with a native of the Sauerland Mountains, low mountains southeast of the Ruhr. Ed. How many of our men are in the trench at the moment? I asked a clarifying question. Lieutenant Augst, and with him 48 soldiers and non-commissioned officers. Have we received any refills in the last few days? Herr Oberleutnant, soldiers are constantly coming and going. The battalion doctor takes care of the minor injuries and then tries to send the soldiers back to the company as soon as possible. Let me ask you if you'd like to come with me to our quartermaster. I'd like to discuss some matters with him, and you might take this opportunity to get to know him. I agreed, and we set off together. The room where the technician, whose last name was Schultz, was housed was the same as the ones described earlier. A room two by three metres, and no more. Together with Schultz, four of us crammed into it, and we filled the shelter completely. The only thing worth mentioning was the cylindrical iron stove which was working at full power. I even felt that I was too hot in that shelter. Bieger was discussing matters of service with his comrades, and I listened to the conversation with interest. Suddenly there was a howl, and we found ourselves in the middle of a raging flame. I was shocked. The only way out of the room was blocked by a wall of fire. We had become our own worst enemies. The heat, 
was unbearable. Although it lasted only seconds, it seemed like an eternity to us. But there was nothing unusual about the incident for the foreman. He raked a blanket from his board bed and threw it over the gasoline canister that stood by the door. Then he grabbed his heavy overcoat and threw it on top, and a miracle happened. In a few seconds, the flames calmed down. But now it became difficult to breathe in the small room because of the smoke. I jumped outside and breathed in the fresh winter air. The others followed me. Bigay was beyond furious. He abandoned the technique. Heck, you know you're not allowed to keep gasoline cans in heated areas. Put it somewhere where there's no risk of it exploding. Big and Schultz apologised to me. By then, I had recovered from the shock and quickly realised what had happened. I had to get used to it. I was now a company commander in a motorised unit. But I didn't have a driver's licence, nor did I have the slightest idea how a motor worked. But that didn't matter now. All that was required of us was to hold on and endure, no matter what it cost us. We were always outnumbered and outgunned. We were all determined and willing to stand to the end. I headed to my company with an outfit delivering meals there. Only a few weeks ago, my Hauptfeldfeebel could easily have gone to the front line with the cook on a cart and delivered food to all the platoons. Now six soldiers were carrying three canisters, in which, alas, only a pitiful semblance of warm food could be found. Bigger carried a few pieces of bread and lard in his sack. We followed each other along the broken path. I was the last to go. Each of us tried desperately to keep our balance. No one spoke. After about ten minutes, we reached the company CP. This CP was nothing more than a hole of about two square metres. My deputy, Lieutenant Augst, appeared and spoke in a whisper to the Hauptfeld fable. At that time, I entered this makeshift dugout. A makeshift lamp dimly illuminated the room. A sheet iron canister turned into a stove gave some heat. Three figures came up to meet me. They were Pavel Lech, Nemetz and Grund, our company barber. I was glad to see again these faces that had become close to me. It is very important to personally know the people who are there for you, especially in a difficult situation. People you've been around for years, with whom you've been through the good and the bad. You know their strengths and their weaknesses. You have more faith in them than you would in a newcomer. This doesn't mean you should underestimate those you don't know personally. It's just a tried and true and universally recognised fact. I shook hands with all three of them and asked Pavelek, Jushko, what are you doing here? I thought you, as a happy husband, were home long ago. The old war horse grimly replied, That would have been fine, but it didn't happen. I reached Kalichondon from where I was supposed to get home by train. But there suddenly it was as if the devil had been let loose. Apparently the Russians had broken through the Romanian positions, and soon the Romanians were already on the bridge over the Don. Idiots, they acted as if they were rearguards. One says butt forward, the other, whoa. If there had been regular troops like us, things would have been very different. Herr Oberleutnant, our soldiers and I would have been able to hold and organise a defence. I tried to calm him down. Well, I doubt we would have done any better there. But all this makes me want to puke. When the Russians did show up on the far side of the Don, just a day later, it meant the end of my leave to get married. I had to hurry back to the company. Sad, Jushko. But why didn't you think of the airfield? You know all the tricks. No, I didn't even think about it. I was very saddened by his bad luck. Nevertheless, I was glad to have him by my side again. So, our Figaro, how long have you been here at the front? It's been three weeks. As Herr Oberleutnant knows, everyone is useful at the front. Herr Lieutenant Augst used me as a messenger to company headquarters after Oberleutnant Willmann was killed. Nemitz, who's still here from our old crowd? We still have eight soldiers left from our company in total, with the rest from the battalion, 24 men. Others came to us from other units. They are mostly headquarters soldiers, artillerymen, communications officers, truck drivers, etc. 
Their infantry training is minimal, but they do their duty honestly and do not complain. We even have non-commissioned officers who have to go on guard duty as sentries. Yes, rank doesn't really mean much now. Every soldier has learned that he must fulfill his duty to his nation and to the fatherland. At this time, Lieutenant Augst entered, bringing with him an invisible wall of icy cold. He quickly closed the entrance behind him, walked over to the fire and began to warm his hands. Damn frost. It's even through the mittens. Guten Abend, Herr Oberleutnant. I'm glad you're here. We can use every soldier here at the front. This morning, hell opened up again on our left, at Voth's battalion. It was hot at 147.6. We all prepared you to move for a counter-attack, but our comrades from Vota battalion managed to show themselves. Russian artillery and heavy mortars shelled the height thoroughly and intensively. Even we were hit by untargeted mortar fire all day long. We are fortunate that these nights have been perfectly calm, although we have to be constantly on our guard. Lieutenant Augst was about my build, maybe even a little shorter than me. With his black hair and dark eyes, he could easily have been a southerner. But when he spoke a few words, his dialect made him sound like a native of Saxony. He found common ground with the Silesians and was an amiable officer who could be relied upon. Herr Augst, when you go into position later, I would like you to briefly bring me up to speed. Before the first light of morning, I would like to be in full possession of the painting. Now that I am staying here, I would like to ask you where you intend to take up your positions. I believe it's on the right flank of Hauptmann Mato's battle group. There are new recruits fighting there. I'd like to take them under my wing, since they have no combat experience. I'll be with Fieldfebel Kupal. OK, I agree with that, since you know better than I do what is needed on the front lines. By the way, if you are not already aware, I inform you that we have a direct connection with Hauptmann Krauser and Oberst Rhenisch. Even the most remote posts have a telephone align, so that we can raise the alarm if something happens. The strip and sitches now always work the night shift. Oh, that's fine. In that case, I can call Mr. Colonel Reinisch and report my arrival to him. I called regimental headquarters and reported my arrival at the company to my new commander and Hauptmann Krause. Then, together with Lieutenant Augst, I had to move to the forward posts. It was impossible to get lost here. If one stepped even one step to the right or left off the beaten path, one could drown in the soft snow. The night was starry. The snow crunched under his boots, and there was not the slightest breeze. I could see the man breathing, for the air he exhaled froze immediately. Small crystals formed in the nose on the inhalation. The entire landscape was coloured white and was ghostly quiet. Only in the distance, from the direction where Stalingrad was located, that cursed city we had failed to take, came the faint sounds of battle. I silently followed Augst, watching the night pictures. Here we arrived at the first forward post and listened to the sentry, who whispered about the situation. Nothing unusual had occurred. A field telephone stood in the corner of the observation post. A machine gun position had been set up, and the machine gun itself was wrapped in a tarpaulin so that it could be used if necessary. On the enemy's side, the snow lay so high that during the daytime it was possible to stealthily reach this position quickly, right from dens in the snow. To call these snow holes shelters or positions would be an exaggeration. It was only possible to build a fire to keep warm at night, because during the day the smoke would give away the location of the position to the enemy, and as a result, targeted mortar fire could be expected. We arrived at the second post. This position was the most remote. It was located right at the foot of height 147.6. A field telephone was also installed here. I recognised both sentries, as they had previously served in other units of our battalion. Augst whispered to me. That height over there is the most important point in this section. It's the responsibility of Major Vota and his soldiers. At the slightest noise there, we must be on high alert in case help is needed. The same goes for Hauptmann Matto's unit on our right. There are two battered tanks standing there. 
one T-34 and one tank of ours from the 16th Panzer Division. This morning the soldiers from Major Voth's battalion managed to repel the attack, but who knows what will happen tomorrow. I looked up at the hill. It was barely visible in the darkness, but it was at least 100-120 metres to its top. We still had three more posts to check. We did not visit the shelters because the soldiers had to be allowed to rest. With their meagre rations and the bitter cold, it would be irresponsible to disturb them, especially when no one knew when the enemy would give us more trouble. It was only at the last post that Lieutenant Augst summoned Field Feeble Kupal. I wanted to say hello to this old soldier of my seventh company, still that old former company. Without further ado, we shook hands. His face looked gaunt, but his slightly crooked nose looked the same as before. Kupal, I said softly. Lieutenant Augst will now stay with you and watch your right flank. Do you have room for him? Jawohl, Herr Oberleutnant, enough room for one man. If anything happens here, call immediately. Jawohl, it's clear. I shook hands with both my companions and wished them well before heading back. Take care of yourselves. I was now fully in charge of this 150 metre wide sector. What would tomorrow bring? How long could we stay here? I had no answers to these questions. Here one could only believe, hope and trust. Jan. At the first light of a new day, the artillery was again talking from the side of the 147.6 height. I tried to contact the second post. The line was still working. The sentry reported that Russian artillery and mortars were shelling the height. Then I recognised the return fire of our machine guns. I could clearly hear the sounds of battle through my earpiece. But my sector was quiet, except for the occasional bursts of mortar shells and the occasional ricochets. Nevertheless, I ordered everyone to be on high alert because no one knew what would happen next. The situation could change in a matter of seconds. Toward noon, the sounds of battle subsided. The commanders in our sector reported that the attack in the Vota Battalion sector had again been repulsed. Our losses were being replenished with soldiers from the rear services and headquarters. We too were to be resupplied. The night of January 3 again required us to be on full alert. A strong Russian assault group suddenly collapsed on the left flank of the Rhinish group, exactly on the boundary line with its neighbour on the left, and cut into our positions. The enemy seized cover. In these brutally cold weather, shelter, where one could keep warm, meant life or death if lost. Battles in winter were fought with particular ferocity. Otherwise, who would want to be without shelter at temperatures that could be compared to a home freezer? Jan. 3. As our comrades had failed to recapture their bunker during the night, I had no doubt that they would try to do so the next night. We could no longer afford to attack during the day, for we had too few heavy weapons and were extremely short of ammunition. Our condition was also affected by the scarcity of our food rations. We were therefore left to bury ourselves in our positions as deeply as possible, to let the enemy close in and to hold on as best we could. But if cover was lost, none of the above helped. We had to attack, and we had to attack unexpectedly by rushing at night. I was not mistaken. On the night of January 3rd 4, the target of our comrades' attack on the left was a shelter, and it was repulsed. Another damned bloody, bloody problem. Jan. 4. On the night of January 4th 5, we again had to be on maximum alert. Fighting broke out on our left, northwest of us, behind height 147.6. The Ivans were now clearly trying to retake cover. I went with Nemitz to the advanced post, when sparks of flame flickered into the sky in the west. They illuminated the whole hill for a few seconds. We had to be on our guard, for the enemy could easily try to cut into our positions if he realised that we were distracted by the sounds of battle. At night, well camouflaged soldiers are difficult to distinguish, especially if the night silence is broken by machine gun bursts and rifle shots. We tried to light fires as little as possible. The sentries were also ordered to be careful. After a while, I went to inspect my right flank. 
There I met Lieutenant Augst, who was talking to our neighbour on the right, Hauptmann Matto. That's how we got to know each other. His station was also quiet so far. Nevertheless, there, like us, everyone was in readiness to rush into battle at any time on the alert. On the way back to my CP, I could still hear the fierce firing of machine guns and rifles on both sides, as well as the short ripple of hand grenade explosions. The battle was still in full swing. I wanted to believe that our soldiers would prevail. Jans, 5. On January 5th, the bad news reached us that the shelter for which we had been fighting so hotly had finally been lost. For us, this meant that the Russians on the northwest side of the 147.6 height were a little closer as a result. The repeated blows on this height made us realize clearly that in the very near future, it would be our turn. We received the promised reinforcements of soldiers who had previously served in the wagons, headquarters and other rear units. It was literally the last recruitment. Feldfebeli, Barmistrov, non-commissioned officers, Ober Efriatel and Efriatel from all units. Thus it became clear that now the army had only one task, to hold out to the last man. Suddenly my company roster was filled with representatives of services that had never been scheduled here in peacetime. This addition undoubtedly brought with it some problems. The first priority was to urgently build shelters for the new arrivals. They had to be set up in places behind the front line so that the enemy could not observe them. Time was running out. The shelters had to be completed while we still occupied the 147.6 height. If this hill was lost, then even during the day all we could count on was constant enemy fire. My comrades understood this and worked non-stop in shifts. In addition, new positions were equipped in the front line. However, they were only snow walls, providing protection only from enemy observation. Those who did not work were sent back to the shelters in the gully. As the ground froze deeply and the physical condition of the soldiers was increasingly deteriorating, construction work progressed with difficulty. Anything that could be used as building material was used. The soldiers behaved impeccably. They understood the gravity of the situation and worked with grim faces and empty stomachs. Rank did not matter. Everyone was vigorously at work, for this terrible cold was the worst of enemies. Surveillance posts were reinforced and rest times for soldiers were reduced. Jan. 6. On January 6th, the Russians tried to capture the height of 147.6, they succeeded in breaking through our front on this section. We were in a state of maximum readiness to counterattack, but my neighbour on the left, Oberleutnant Korte, managed to eliminate the enemy breakthrough in his section. He himself was killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Russians. Nevertheless, the height remained in our hands. We were lucky again. We devoted almost all our time to building shelters. We knew little about the general situation in which the army found itself but I was sure that our comrades in Stalingrad and on the other fronts had it no easier, because the cold was the same everywhere. Hauptmann Krauser told me that the Volga had frozen over and the Russians were now ferrying their troops and equipment right across the ice. This was unpleasant news for us, but we were only soldiers who had to obey orders. We had to do our duty, to be faithful to our oath to the Führer, to the nation and to the Fetaland. No one asked if it was the right thing to do. We believed that we were defending our people against the doctrine of Bolshevism, which threatened the entire free world. Did not the British and Americans bitterly regret afterward, and more than once, that they had sided with these Reds? I mentally went back to the saying of Frederick II the Great, It doesn't matter if I live, it only matters that I do my duty well. And that was exactly what we the soldiers of the 6th Army, did. It did not matter whether we were from the north, south, west or east of our homeland, whether we were from Prussia, Bavaria, Swabia, Saxony, South Germany or Austria. No one asked where our soldierly destiny was to take us. All our destinies were in the hands of God. Jan. 9. It's about to be January 10th, it's almost midnight. 
I went with my messenger Nemetz, as I did every evening, to inspect my section from left to right. The second sentry, who was on duty directly below 147.6, reported to me, Herr Oberleutnant, the division called. The general wants to speak to you immediately. I was surprised. What could my divisional commander need from me? I had not had the opportunity to get to know him personally until then. After hearing several times, one moment, connecting, the other end chimed in. Angern's here. This is Oberleutnant Hull, commander of the 1st Company, 79th Motorized Regiment. I've been ordered to call you, Herr General. Yes, that's right. My dear Hull, I am pleased to be able to announce your promotion to the rank of Hauptmann. You were promoted to this rank by Colonel General Paulus on January 1st, 1943. Congratulations, and I wish you always good luck as a soldier. I was stunned for a few seconds, and then I answered, Thank you, humbly, Herr General. What was it? A dream or reality after all? Nemetz asked, What is it, Herr Oberleutnant? What a misfortune, Nemetz. I've just been promoted to Hauptmann. Wonderful. Congratulations. His gaunt face glowed with genuine joy. The sentry, one of the few remaining Silesians in my company, joined in the congratulations. We moved on. I thought about this sudden promotion that had caught me in a forward position. It must have been organised by my former regimental commander, Colonel Grosser, his adjutant, Oberleutnant Kells, as well as Kraus, who commanded the units in our section, were promoted to the rank of Hauptmann on December 1st, 1942. I was the last of the old company commanders in the regiment. By order of the Führer, an extraordinary promotion could only follow when the rank was given after a particularly long period of delay in production. This could be the only explanation. Nemetz made sure that the other sentries also heard the news. Wherever I appeared, I had to shake hands with the soldiers who congratulated me. Although I was pleased, the brutal, unrelenting reality brought me back to reality. What did the ranks matter now? Everything now depended on the personal qualities of each of us, on whether he had enough will to hold on to the end. In our hiding place, Pavelic suddenly asked me, Herr Hauptmann, where will you now get two pins on your epaulettes so that everyone can see your rank? Zushko, it doesn't matter now. We'll have more time to take care of it. Colonel Rainish called. He and my comrade Hauptmann Kraus congratulated me. Kraus also informed me that he had two pins for my epaulettes and that the messenger Marek would deliver them to me at the first opportunity. I thanked him for this courtesy. Jan 10 On January 10th, the Russians opened hurricane fire at about 10 de Gaulle. We feared the worst. Regardless of the direction, the sounds of battle could be heard from everywhere. The main blow, as it turned out, was struck at the sight of our division. Judging by the intensity of the fire preparation, it was obvious that the Russians had considerably strengthened their grouping at the expense of troops transferred across the frozen Volga. The first Russian attack was stopped not far from the front line. We had to defend ourselves with machine guns and rifles only. A few volleys of our artillery were aimed and helped us a lot. After a brief respite, the Ivans again attempted to reach their goal and again they were repulsed. My comrades fought with a tenacity that they did not seem to expect of themselves, but what choice did we have? To be taken prisoner? To those Bolsheviks? Never. Our losses were high, though mostly wounded. When it got quieter, those who could not move on their own were taken to the rear. I didn't know where our field hospital was, or what served as it. Our doctors must have had their hands full. Did they have enough medicine now? The smaller the size of the cauldron became, the more difficult it was for the rear units. But those of us who fought here on the front line knew almost nothing about it. We were fortunate in that we got men from the rear units. They replaced the dead fighters. Now our nucleus was a few men with combat experience. They served as a cementing force and an example for the newcomers. Naturally, soldiers' language is harsh and even cruel, 
and every day we listened to numerous complaints, but they were expressed, frankly, without attempts at rebellion. Even I allowed myself a coarse soldier's swearing, some of the jargon of my fellow countrymen. It served as a kind of safety valve, preventing us from simply going mad. It was a powerless anger at what was coming at us and what we couldn't do anything about. Day by day the rear supply worsened. Only the front-line units still received their 200 grams of bread, all others had to make do with 100 grams. The soup consisted of one water and horse meat put through a meat grinder. It seems that flour or any other additives that might have made the soup thicker were now absent from it as such. I have now learned what fatalism is. You just try not to think about what tomorrow and the day after tomorrow will bring. I was lucky in that I did not smoke. If I could get a few cigarettes on the front line, which was increasingly rare, the inveterate smokers looked at them with religious awe. One such stick was passed from mouth to mouth and smoked to the end, burning the fingers of the one who got the last one. The smoke was inhaled and held in the lungs as long as possible. Most smokers closed their eyes. Finally, the tobacco smoke was exhaled with a loud sigh. Jan. 11. The enemy's fire and attacks continued all day, January 11th. The enemy came closer and closer to the front of our neighbour on the left. He got the shelters with their dead inhabitants. He followed the same tactics on January 12. Our position became even more threatening. Jan. 12. On the night of January 13, the few remaining soldiers on the left flank and in the centre of the division's defensive section were withdrawn to the Spartakovka Gumrak railway line. Now, in the sector of the group Rheinisch, in our hands, remained only height, 147.6. We were lucky that the Russians did not pay attention to it and pursued us rather passively. A new defensive line, consisting of bunkers, still built by Romanian troops and located about 1.5 kilometres behind the old front line, was occupied by our neighbours on the left. We remained in our former positions, awaiting further enemy attacks on the vital 147.6 height, Jan. 14. Now the enemy realised what we were doing. He concentrated his fire on height 147.6, shooting our positions almost strictly from a westerly direction. This tactic put us at a disadvantage, as the left flank of the division was no longer able to hold its former positions and was forced to move back. We found ourselves practically under flank fire. How were we to defend ourselves now? The division quickly realised this. We too were ordered to pull back to new positions. Many soldiers were not happy about it, and I understood them perfectly well. All the effort we had spent, all our work over the past few days had been in vain. We knew what we had managed to build here, on this defensive line for our selves. But what was waiting for us at the new positions? What if there was nothing at all and only these fierce frosts? We pulled back on the night of January 14-15. We left practically nothing behind us except empty ammunition boxes. We took turns carrying two machine guns and a couple of boxes of ammunition. Tired to the point of exhaustion, the crowd of soldiers struggled to make their way through the snow. I warned everyone to keep up. The soldiers had to move in pairs and look out for each other. The first sign of frostbite is when your nose and cheeks turn white. As a rule, people just don't pay attention to it. If this happens, the only way to restore blood circulation is to rub snow on the area. I turned to my subordinates with the words, Comrades, Stay close together. We can't go far. The stragglers will have to be left behind and they may freeze to death. The soldiers understood. I tried to pull myself together. The responsibility was too great. They all trusted me. If only I didn't let my men down. When our exhausted crowd, and the people looked like they could no longer be called a military unit, moved forward with great difficulty, Every metre we passed became a torture for us, and 1,500 metres seemed endless. Nevertheless, we passed them. The strongest were assigned to patrol. The remnants of my old veterans gathered beside me, and along with this nucleus of the unit walked Lieutenant Augst. 
There was nothing left in us of the inspiration and confidence that had inspired us during the last few weeks, and of that former fierce determination to conquer Stalin's city. We performed our duty mechanically, like automatons. We felt some threat unknown before, but could not understand its nature. When we had a hard time, we shot and fought like a badly wounded animal, cornered, which defends itself to the end while it still has strength left. Jan. 17. This is what happened on January 17th. The enemy again unleashed his attacks on the left flank of our neighbours. The shelters were lost, retaken, then lost again and retaken again. In the end, however, the numerical superiority of the enemy told. However, he was stalling and acting cautiously, for he knew that we were almost finished. I and my comrades did not want to admit it. We simply could not believe that our Sixth Army was facing such a bitter end. Up to this point we had always done our duty, doing even the impossible, and yet now we stood on the brink of disaster. The boiler is dissected into northern and southern parts. January 21, 22, 1943. Jan. 21, for three days, now we have had no hot food. Blood circulation can only be kept up by movement if we are out in the open air, or by squatting as we cram ourselves into the dark openings of the crevices called bunkers. At the signal of the alarm, the human creatures throw off their fatigue and defend themselves with their last strength. This state of affairs has lasted for the past three days. I sent Pavelek and two soldiers with the task of fending our spiss and getting us something to eat. He returned early in the morning and brought hardly 100 grams of bread per man, which we ate as greedily as if it were a cake. Jan, 22. On January 22nd, my old faithful messenger Marek arrived to take me to the CP to see Hauptmann Kraus, the commander of the units in our section. Kraus, whose headquarters consists of only a handful of men, also lives in miserable conditions. You can read the tension on our faces, the result of a sense of responsibility for our comrades. Kraus informed me that next night the entire division should withdraw southward beyond Gorodishche to the northwestern outskirts of Stalingrad. Resistance, German troops on the western and southern facets of the cauldron completely exhausted. Our troops are being pressed everywhere and in the city of Stalingrad itself. The cauldron is cut into northern and southern parts. My company will fulfil the role of rearguard. We must leave the front line immediately after dark on January 23rd. On the map, Hauptmann Kraus showed me the position we should take. It was located in a gully near Orlovka, just where the new defensive line, which stretches from east to west, makes a loop to the south at almost a right angle, and then continues along the western edge of the city. I learned that on January 10th, the ultimatum to surrender our army expired, because the army command did not respond to it. Surrender and captivity meant something completely new to us. We had never allowed ourselves to even think about it, let alone talk about it, 